Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, good afternoon. My name is Jordan Redavid, and I also represent the respondent in this matter, Deputy Hallie Chase. Civil actions filed in accordance with Section 1983 parallel common law tort actions in that both require the plaintiff, or in this case the petitioner, to prove that the defendant's actions were the proximate cause of the harm alleged. Here, the ultimate harm alleged was the wrongful prosecution and wrongful arrest of Mr. Porterman, but the defendant's actions were not the proximate cause of that for two independent reasons. First, this Court's recent decision, Rayburg v. Polk, cloaks the defendant or the respondent in this matter with the protections of absolute immunity. And second, when the grand jury returned an indictment, it constituted an independent determination of probable cause and severed the chain of proximate causation. Right, but wasn't she the proximate cause by beginning by signing a probable cause affidavit that, number one, she did not have the authority to do, and two, a probable cause affidavit that omitted uh, material facts? Well, I think that gets to a second leg of my approach, but it's important to remember the first, and that is that there is a presumption, always, that when a grand jury returns an indictment, it will break the chain of causation. And so the burden is now on the petitioner in this case to weld that chain back together using references to material omissions, as Your Honor just pointed out. But it is important to note that the reference to omissions is very misleading because what we have here is a case where an investigating officer had two very marked discrepancies. One was a 20-year age difference, and the other was a misspelling by a letter. Both required further investigation. Both got that further investigation. She followed up, meaning the respondent, with the complaining witness and asked for a confirmation of spelling. She followed up with the complaining witness and asked, how do you explain a 20-year age difference? To which the response was, I'm terrible with ages. He definitely could have been 40. So they're not necessarily omissions as much as they are an officer who's voted two-time deputy of the year making a judgment call to say these are no longer relevant facts. Now, it's important to note that a majority of circuit case law in this, in this country, which, although not binding, is heavily persuasive, does not require such a low standard as the district court erroneously applied, being the mere taint standard. In fact, that standard is untenable because it would put a respondent, the respondent in this position, or anybody else similarly situated, to constantly be defending against the threat of 1983 liability when the petitioner would only have to put forth mere conclusory allegations of taint. You want us to adopt an affirmative deception. That's uh, correct, Your Honor. I, I just point this out. If you pull your brief on page 28, I assume it's a misstatement, but it says Chase's actions should be considered affirmatively deceptive. Is that what you meant? No, Your Honor. That, if, that's in the, if that is in our brief, then that is a glaring misstatement of, of what our position is. Yeah, and I figured, but when I read that, I just wanted to make sure you hadn't changed your mind on the appeal. No, Your Honor, I appreciate you bringing that to the Court's attention so that we can clarify before you today that we do not concede that what the respondent did in this matter was anything to rise to the level of affirmative deception. In fact, the petitioner in this case has not provided anything to suggest that there was any malice or any intent to deceive the grand jury. In fact, right before the respondent went before the grand jury, the prosecutor asked for a report. Conveniently, the respondent had both reports, the full and the report summary. She was not told, provide me this summary. She said, just, we just need one. So she made a judgment call and handed over one. Is that an affirmative, an attempt to affirmatively deceive? Surely not. And focusing again on the grand jury testimony, if anything, this is just a shoddy examination by the prosecutor who's in charge of how the grand jury hearing operates. She was prompted to give a narrative, namely, tell us about this case. That was all. So the respondent told her and the grand jury about the case. Had there been any thorough follow-up, any at all, any question, respondent, was there ever a time where you had a doubt? She would have answered it truthfully. We know that well, now course, because... Of course, but the grand jury wasn't given the full picture. The grand jury was given sort of a road map that inevitably led to them as they say, indicting a ham sandwich. Here, if the grand jury had been told about the age, they may not have issued the indictment. At I, least that's a possibility, isn't it? Certainly a possibility. And I think what's important is to bring this court's attention now to the Fifth Circuit's decision in Shields versus Twiss. The facts, the underlying facts of that case are almost completely analogous in that there was a 1983 action filed by someone who was wrongfully accused of sexually molesting a minor. 
In that case, the allegations mirrored those of the petitioner before you today, in that there was a shoddy investigation, and had a more thorough investigation been performed, exculpatory information would have been found and all of it would have been preempted. That's precisely what's before you today, and that's why that this court should give it the same disposition of the, as the Fifth Circuit in that case, which said the petitioner failed to prove that there was any malice or intent to deceive the grand jury or the prosecutor in that case, and that there is no burden on well, an investigating she, officer. Was she not asked at the grand jury proceeding, was she not asked, is there anything after giving a narrative, was she not asked, is there anything additional you would like to tell the grand jury? Correct, Your Honor. And that's and she, not and, and her reply and she said was, nothing. She no, said, not no. at this time. Correct. And that gets back to the very first point. And of then that. she is also, during the course, I gather, of a deposition saying, you know, if, if, uh, if the fellow is innocent, then he'll figure it out. It seems to me that all of that rises to affirmative uh, misstatements. Well, Your Honors, it's important to remember what we're here on, and that's a granted summary judgment. And most, most importantly, we're here on a 1983 case, so we have to conduct a traditional proximate cause analysis. Now, although this court granted certiorari to investigate thoroughly the role of the grand jury's indictment, it is important to mention that the overwhelming... I'm assuming that Mr. Porterman would simply like to have the case reversed so they can have an evidentiary hearing. Am I incorrect? The respondent cannot speak to what the petitioner's ultimate goals are in this case, but that would certainly seem to be a natural fit. But unfortunately for the petitioner, there is no available redress for his unfortunate situation. The respondent concedes that as a matter of sheer policy alone, you would feel as a bleeding heart that the petitioner should be entitled to redress. But every circuit in this country has already made that policy determination. What are you suggesting, that if someone agrees with you, they're a bleeding heart? I apologize, Your Honor. I, can Are you, you suggesting that anyone who agrees with the petitioner is a bleeding heart? No, Your Honor. The respondent is only putting forth this court that we are not heartless and we understand that a wrong was made here, but it is not the fault of the respondent. Now, this court has fashioned absolute immunity to cloak prosecutors in their role. And in this particular case, so, uh, Assistant State Attorney Edna Collins is certainly not blameless but she can't be before this court today because she's shielded with absolute immunity. So as the Ninth Circuit pointed out so aptly, in the current situa in the current context of criminal law as it relates to 1983 actions, only investigating officers have their nose open to potential liability. And it's for that very reason that this court and other courts should adopt a higher standard to protect those investigating officers. Now here, if the petitioner has, shown, has brought forth anything to show that the respondent affirmatively deceived the grand jury, then certainly it would not be appropriate for summary judgment. What if the prosecutor affirmatively deceives the jury? Is, is, is the prosecutor liable? No, Your Honor. That's she, the prosecutor in this case, or in that hypothet, or anything that comes close is protected by prosecutorial immunity. So that's why it's important to remember here, although the ultimate harm, because there is a harm here, wrongful prosecution, for sure, this person should not have been hauled before the court, the respondent's actions were not the cause, certainly not the proximate cause. Now, certainly got the wheels in motion. There's no denying that. The submission of a probable cause affidavit foreseeably starts a criminal prosecution, but it was the independent decision of the prosecutor and then the independent decision of the grand jury to indict and move forward throughout those, those proceedings. And just because those latter participants are protected from immunity doesn't mean that all liability should fall on the initial actor. That just doesn't comport with our traditional notions of proximate cause. And it's for those foregoing reasons that this court should affirm the grant of summary judgment in favor of the, in favor of the respondent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.